Hello, and welcome to Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, the podcast. Written by Eliezer Yudkowsky, read by Ineash Brodsky, based on the works of J.K. Rowling. First half of Chapter 72, Self-Actualization, Part 7, Plausible Deniability. The winter sun had well set by the time dinner ended, and so it was amid the peaceful light of stars twinkling down from the enchanted ceiling of the great hall that Hermione left for the Ravenclaw Tower alongside her study partner Harry Potter, who lately seemed to have a ridiculous amount of time for studying. She hadn't the faintest idea of when Harry was doing his actual homework, except that it was getting done, maybe by house elves while he slept. Nearly every single pair of eyes in the whole hall lay on them as they passed through the mighty doors of the dining room, which were more like siege gates of a castle than anything students ought to go through on the way back from supper. They went out without speaking and walked until the distant babble of student conversation had faded into silence. And then the two of them went on a little further through the stone corridors before Hermione finally spoke. Why'd you do that, Harry? Do what? said the boy who lived in an abstracted tone, as if his mind were quite elsewhere, thinking about vastly more important things. I mean, why didn't you just tell them no? Well, Harry said as their shoes pattered across the tiles, I can't just go around saying no every time someone asks me about something I haven't done. I mean, suppose someone asks me, Harry, did you pull the prank with the invisible paint? And I say, no. And then they say, Harry, do you know who messed with the Gryffindor Seeker's broomstick? And I say, I refuse to answer that question. It's sort of a giveaway. And that's why... Hermione said carefully... You told everyone... She concentrated, remembering the exact words... That if hypothetically there was a conspiracy, you could not confirm or deny that the true master of the conspiracy was Salazar Slytherin's ghost... And in fact, you wouldn't even be able to admit the conspiracy existed, so people ought to stop asking you questions about it. Yep, said Harry Potter, smiling slightly. That'll teach him to take hypothetical scenarios too seriously. And you told me not to answer anything. They might not believe you if you deny it. So it's better to say nothing, unless you want them to think you're a liar. But... Hermione said helplessly. But now people think I'm doing things for Salazar Slytherin. The way the Gryffindors had been looking at her, the way the Slytherins had been looking at her. It goes along with being a hero. Have you seen what the Quibbler says about me? For a brief second, Hermione imagined her parents reading a newspaper article about her, and instead of the story being about her winning a nationwide spelling bee or any of the other ways she imagined getting into the papers, the headline said, Hermione Granger gets Draco Malfoy pregnant. It was enough to make you think twice about the whole heroin business. Harry's voice turned a bit more formal. Speaking of which, Miss Granger, how goes your latest quest? Well, said Hermione, unless the ghost of Salazar Slytherin really does show up and tell us where to find bullies, I don't think we're going to have much luck. Not that she was sorry about that. She glanced over at Harry and saw the boy giving her a peculiarly intense look. You know, Hermione... The boy said quietly, as though to make sure that nobody else in the world heard. I think you're right. I think some people get a lot more help than others in becoming heroes. And I don't think that's fair either. Harry grabbed at her witch's robes where they lay over her arm and hustled her into a side hall of the corridor they were walking through, her mouth gaping open in surprise even as Harry's wand came into his hand. They rounded a curve of the side hall, and it was so narrow that it was almost pushing her and Harry into each other, even as Harry pointed to the way they'd just come and softly said, Quietus, and then a moment later, in the other direction, Quietus, again. The boy looked searchingly around them, not just to every side, but even upward toward the ceiling and down toward the floor. And then Harry stuck a hand in his pouch and said, Invisibility cloak. Bleep, said Hermione. Harry was already drawing out folds of shimmering black fabric from the mokeskin device. Don't worry, the boy said with a small grin. They're so rare that nobody bothered to make a school rule against them. And Harry held out the dark velvet mesh to her and said, his voice strangely formal, I do not give you, but loan you, my cloak, unto Hermione Jean Granger. Protect her well. 
She stared at the shimmering velvet of the cloak, cloth that swallowed all the light that fell on it except what glinted from small, strange reflections. Fabric so perfectly black it should have shown dust or lint or something, but it didn't. The longer you looked, the more you felt like what you were seeing wasn't really there at all. But then you blinked again, and it was just a black cloak. Take it, Hermione. Hardly even thinking, Hermione stretched out her hand to grasp the fabric. And then, just as her brain woke up and she started to pull her hand back, Harry let go of the cloak and it started to fall, and she grabbed at it without thinking. And the instant her fingers touched and held the cloak, she felt an intangible jolt run through her, like picking up her wand for the first time. And it was like she heard a song being sung, ever so faintly, in the back of her mind. That's one of my quest items, Hermione, Harry said softly. It belonged to my father, and it's not something I can replace if it's lost. Don't loan it to anyone else. Don't show it to anyone. Don't tell anyone it exists. But if you want to borrow it for a while, just come to me and ask. Hermione finally tore her eyes loose from the depthless black folds and stared back up at Harry. I can't. You certainly can, Harry said. Because there's nothing even the tiniest bit fair about my finding this gift wrapped in a box next to my bed one morning, and you not. Harry paused thoughtfully. Unless you did get your own invisibility cloak, in which case never mind. Then the implications of invisibility cloak finally dawned on her, and she pointed a shocked finger at Harry, though they were close enough together that she couldn't quite straighten her arm properly and her voice rose with considerable indignation as she said, So that's how you disappeared from the potions closet, and the time when... And then she trailed off, because even with an invisibility cloak, she couldn't see how Harry had... Harry buffed his fingernails on his robes with artful nonchalance and said, Well, you knew there had to be some trick to it, right? And now the heroine will mysteriously know where and when to find bullies, just like she listened to the bullies planning it, even though nobody her age could possibly have turned herself invisible to spy on them. There was a pause and a silence. Harry, I'm, I'm not sure anymore that fighting bullies is such a good idea. Harry's eyes stayed steady on hers. Because the other girls might get hurt? She nodded, just nodded. That's their choice, Hermione, just like it's yours. I decided not to do the obvious stupid thing that everyone does in books and try to keep you safe and protected and helpless and have you get really angry at me and push me away while you go off on your own and get into even more trouble and then heroically pull through it successfully after which I'd finally have my epiphany and realize that blah 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 etc. I know how that part of my life story goes so I'm just skipping over it. If I can predict what I'm going to think later, I might as well go ahead and think it now. Anyway, my point is, you shouldn't smother your friends to keep them safe either. Just tell them up front it's predictably going to go horribly wrong, and if they still want to be heroines after that, fine. It was at times like this that Hermione wondered if she was ever going to get used to the way Harry thought. Harry, it really... Her voice stuck for a second really, really don't want them getting hurt, especially because of something I started. Hermione, Harry said seriously, I'm pretty sure you did the right thing. I don't see what could realistically happen to them that would be worse for them in the long run than not trying. What if they get badly hurt? Hermione said. Her voice felt blocked in her throat. She remembered Captain Ernie saying how Harry had just stared straight into the eyes of a bully as the bully bent his finger back before Professor Sprout had arrived to save him. And there was another thought that came after that, about Hannah and her delicate hands with the fingernails that she carefully painted in Hufflepuff yellow every morning. But that wasn't allowed to be imagined. And then they'll never do anything courageous ever again. I don't think it works like that, Harry said steadily. Even if it all goes mind-bogglingly wrong, I don't think it works like that inside a human mind. The important thing is believing about yourself that you're someone who can break your boundaries. Trying and getting hurt can't possibly be worse for you than being... stuck. What if you're wrong, Harry? 
Harry paused for a moment, then shrugged a little sadly and said, What if I'm right? Hermione looked back at the black mesh running over her hand. From the inside, the cloak felt strangely soft and yet firm against her palm, as if it was trying to give her hand a reassuring hug. Then she lifted her arm back up, holding the cloak back to Harry. Harry didn't move to take it. I... I mean, thank you. Thank you a lot, but I'm still thinking about it, so you can take it back for now. And... Harry, I don't think it's right to spy on people. Not even on known bullies to rescue their victims? I've never been bullied, but I've been through a realistic simulation, and it didn't feel very pleasant. Have you ever been bullied, Hermione? No. She said in a quiet voice, and went on holding out Harry's invisibility cloak to him. Finally, Harry took back his cloak. She felt a small twitch of loss as the inaudible song vanished from the back of her mind, and started to stuff the black material back into his pouch. As the pouch ate the last of the fabric, Harry turned from her to break the quieting barrier. And, um... Hermione said. That's not the Cloak of Invisibility, is it? The one we read about in the library on page 18 of Polivira's translation of Gottschalk's An Illustrated Scroll of Lost Devices? Harry turned his head back, grinning slightly, and said in exactly the same tone of voice he'd used earlier with the other students at dinner, I cannot confirm or deny that I possess magical artifacts of incredible power. When Hermione climbed into bed that night, she was still trying to decide. Her life had been simpler at dinner time, back when there hadn't been any practical way for them to find bullies. And now she had to choose again, not for herself this time, but for her friends. In her mind's eye, she kept seeing Dumbledore's lined face and the pain it hadn't quite hidden. And in her mind's ears, she kept hearing Harry's voice saying, That's their choice, Hermione, just like it's yours. And her hand kept remembering the sensation of the cloak against her fingers, replaying it over and over in her mind. There was a power to the feeling that compelled her thoughts to return to it, and to the song she'd heard, hadn't heard, in a part of her mind and magic which now lay silent once more. Harry had spoken to the cloak like it was a person, telling it to take good care of her. Harry had said the cloak had belonged to his father, that he couldn't replace it if it was lost. But Harry wouldn't really do that, would he? Just hand her one of the three Deathly Hallows created centuries before Hogwarts? She could say that she felt flattered, but this went way beyond feeling flattered, into making her wonder just what she was to Harry exactly. Maybe Harry was the sort of person who went around loaning ancient lost magical artifacts to anyone he considered a friend. But... But when she thought about which part of his life Harry had said he'd skipped over, the part where he tried to keep her safe and protected... Hermione stared up at the ceiling of the Ravenclaw dorm. Somewhere beyond her bed, Mandy and Sue were talking. She'd turned up her quieting charm to where she couldn't hear the exact words, but could still hear their faint murmur. There was something comforting about sleeping in a dorm with the other girls. Harry kept his own quieter turned all the way up, she knew. She was starting to wonder if maybe Harry actually did, well, you know, like her. It took Hermione Granger a long time to fall asleep that night. And when she woke up the next morning, there was a small slip of parchment peeking out from under her pillow, which said, At half past ten, you will find a bully in the fourth passageway to the left of the hall, leaving the potions classroom. Signed, S. When Hermione entered the Great Hall that morning, her stomach was filled with flying butterflies the size of hippogriffs. Even as she approached the Ravenclaw breakfast table, she still hadn't decided what to do. There was an empty place next to Padma she saw. That would be where to sit down if she was going to tell Padma and then ask Padma to tell Daphne and Tracy. Hermione walked toward the empty place next to Padma. There were words waiting in her throat. Padma, I got a mysterious message. And she could feel a huge brick wall inside her, stopping the words from coming out. She'd be putting Hannah and Susan and Daphne in danger. 
taking them and leading them by the hand straight into trouble. That was wrong. Or she could just go and try to handle the bully herself without telling her friends anything, and that, quite obviously, was also wrong. Hermione knew she was being faced with a moral dilemma just like all those wizards and witches she'd read about in stories. Only in stories, people always got a right choice and a wrong choice, not two wrong ones, which seemed a bit unfair. But she had the sense, somehow, maybe it came from the way Harry always talked about how the history books would see them, that she was faced with a heroic decision, and that her whole life might end up going one way or another, depending on what she chose right now, this morning. Hermione sat down at the table without looking to either side, just gazing at the plate and silverware like they might have answers hidden inside, thinking as hard as she ever had. And a few seconds later, she heard Padma's voice whispering almost in her ear, Daphne says she knows where the bully's going to be at 10.30 today. Doomed. They were all doomed, in Susan Bones' opinion. Auntie sometimes told stories which started out like this, people doing something they knew was stupid, and the stories usually ended with someone being doomed all over the floor and all over the walls and getting on Auntie's shoes. Hey, Padma, muttered Parvati, her voice just barely audible over the soft impacts of eight girls tiptoeing through the corridors leading to the potions classroom. Do you know why Hermione's been sighing all morning? No talking! hissed Lavender, the harsh whisper sounding much louder than Parvati's mutter. You never know when evil might be listening. Shh! said three other girls even more loudly. Utterly, totally, quite extremely doomed. As they approached the fourth passageway to the left of the potions classroom, where Daphne's mysterious informant had said the bullying would take place, the eight of them moved slower. The sound of their feet got softer, and finally General Granger made the gesture that meant, Halt, I'll look ahead. Lavender raised a hand then, and when Hermione turned to look at her, Lavender, looking puzzled, pointed straight down the corridor, gestured to herself, and then tried to sign something else that Susan didn't understand. General Granger shook her head, and once again, this time with slower, more exaggerated movements, made the sign for, Halt! I'll look ahead. Lavender, looking even more puzzled, pointed back the way they'd come and made a bouncing gesture with her other hand. Now everyone was looking even more confused than Lavender, and Susan thought with some acerbity that evidently one hour of practice done two days ago wasn't enough to remember a new set of code signals. Hermione pointed at Lavender, then at the floor beneath Lavender's feet, the expression on her face making it very clear that the intended meaning was you stay here. Lavender nodded. Doom, 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 went the words of the Chaos Legion's marching song through Susan's mind. Doom, 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 doom. Hermione reached into her robes and drew out a little rod with a mirror on the end of it and an eyepiece. Very, very softly indeed, the Ravenclaw girl crept up to the wall right next to where the passageway opened off the corridor and peeked just the tip of the eyepiece around the corner. Then a little more. Then a little more. Then General Granger cautiously stuck her head around the side. General Granger turned back to them, nodded, and made the hand gesture for, Follow me. Susan felt a little better as she crept forward. The part of the plan which called for them to arrive 30 minutes before the bully had, apparently, actually worked. Maybe they were only slightly doomed? At 10.29, almost on the dot, the bully showed up. If anyone had been present to hear, though the corridor was apparently empty, they would have heard his shoes clicking solidly through the main corridor, entering the passageway, walking toward where the passageway turned its first corner, turning that corner, and then stopping in some surprise upon seeing that the passageway now terminated in a solid brick wall where no wall had been before. The bully shrugged and turned away as he leaned back to watch the main passage from just around the corner. It was the Castle Hogwarts, after all. 
Behind the hastily transfigured thin panels they'd assembled into the outward appearance of a brick wall, the girls waited. Not speaking, not moving, hardly even breathing, but watching through the eye holes they'd left themselves. As Susan's gaze took in the bully, she could feel the tightening of her chest all the way into her toes. The boy looked to be in his seventh year, if not older, and his robes were trimmed in green instead of the red they'd been hoping for. And he had muscles. And after staring for a bit longer, Susan realized his stance had the balance that meant he dueled. Then they all heard the sounds of more feet approaching from the corridor. The fourth-year Gryffindors and Slytherins had just been let out of potions class. The footsteps pattered past and diminished and faded, and the bully didn't do anything. For a moment, Susan felt an instant of relief. Then another, smaller group of footsteps approached. The bully still didn't do anything as the footsteps went past. That happened a few more times. And then, as there approached the faintly audible sound of one last set of footsteps, the seven girls heard the bully's voice saying, clear and cold and quiet, Protego. Someone did gasp then, though fortunately very, very quietly. If they couldn't get in even a single shot... The bullies were learning already, Susan realized. She hadn't expected Spew to be able to do this very often before the bullies caught on, but... Hermione had already defeated three bullies, and the school had been buzzing with speculation about Salazar Slytherin's ghost yesterday. He's expecting us. Susan would have whispered to give up, to abort the plan, only there was no way to convey a message to... Silencio, said the bully in a soft, deliberate voice, with his wand pointed toward the corridor, the blue haze of his shielding charm shimmering around him. Accio victim. When the fourth-year boy came into their field of vision, he was dangling upside down, as if an invisible hand were holding him high by one leg, his red-trimmed robes beginning to slide down his thighs to reveal the pants underneath. His mouth was opening and closing helplessly, no sound coming out. I suppose you're wondering what's going on. The seventh-year Slytherin said in a quiet, cold voice. Don't worry. It's so simple even a Gryffindor could understand. With that, the Slytherin's left hand formed a fist and drove hard into the Gryffindor's belly. The fourth-year boy's body jerked around frantically, but still no words left his mouth. You're my victim. I'm a bully, I'm going to beat you up, and we'll see if anyone stops me. It was at that moment that Susan realized it was a trap. And in almost the same moment, there rang out the mighty and high-pitched voice of a young girl, crying, Stop, evildoer! Finite incantatum! Lavender, thought Susan, agonized. The Gryffindor girl had volunteered to be a distraction, while the rest of them executed a flank attack from where the bully wouldn't expect it. That had been the plan, only now... In the name of Hogwarts! cried Lavender's voice, though they couldn't see her. And in the name of heroines everywhere, I command you to let go of that... Spelliamus. Stupefy. Accio, stupid heroine. When Lavender floated into their vision, dangling by one foot and unconscious, Susan blinked. The girl was dressed in a bright crimson and gold skirt and blouse instead of her usual Hogwarts robes. The bully was also giving the girl's upside-down body an odd look, and then he pointed his wand at her and said, Venite incantatum. But the clothes stayed the same. Then the bully shrugged and, still facing in the direction of Lavender instead of the dangling fourth-year boy, drew back his fist. Lagan! yelled five voices, and five green spirals blasted from five wands aimed through five holes in the false wall. And an instant later, Hermione's voice shouted, Stupefy! Five green spirals shattered ineffectually on blue haze, and Hermione's red bolt bounced off the haze and struck the fourth-year boy, who jerked and then was still. And the seventh-year bully turned around, smiling grimly, as the first-year girls screamed and charged. Susan's eyes flew open, and instantly she was rolling away from where she'd lain on the floor, her lungs still on fire and her whole body still aching from where she'd been hit. The battle had only moved a few seconds from what she could see, Hannah's body falling with her arms still stretched out towards Susan. Glissio, 
shouted Hermione, but the older boy just slashed his wand down, leaving a trail of green glow behind and Hermione's charm visibly disrupted into a shower of blue-white sparks. And then, in almost the same motion, the bully said, Stupefy! And Hermione was blown backward, and Susan summoned up all the magic she had left and shouted, Innervate! at Hermione's body, even as the bully turned toward her. The bully's wand pointed in her direction again, and then Padma yelled, Prismatis! Just before the bully shouted, Impedimente! The rainbow sphere forming around the bully, and the seventh-year Slytherin staggered as his own hex was reflected back at him. But an instant later, the bully's wand swept back to tap himself, and then Padma's prismatic sphere shattered like a blown soap bubble as the bully's wand cut through it and... Enervate! yelled Parvati at Hannah's body, and Tracy and Lavender screamed at the same time, Wingardium Leviosa! Hannah Abbott held out her wand with a hand that trembled with exhaustion. She didn't have enough magic left for even one innervate now. The rest of the passageway was silent, scattered bodies lying across the ground, Padma and Tracy and Lavender, Hermione and Parvati in a heap against one wall. Susan standing in petrified rigor as her eyes tracked it all helplessly. Even the Gryffindor boy lying sprawled and motionless. Hermione had woken him and he'd fought, but it hadn't been enough. It had been a very short battle. The bully was still smiling, the only signs of his exertion a wavering ripple in the blue glow surrounding him and a few beads of sweat on his forehead. The bully raised his arm, wiped the sweat off his forehead, and stalked toward her like a man-shaped living lethefold. Hannah turned and fled, spun and ran, with screams kept bound in her choking throat, sprinted past the fallen paneling of the fake brick wall, ran down the passageway with all the speed she could muster, weaving as much as she could. Just before Hannah got to the turn in the passageway, the bully's voice from behind her said, Cluth and she got awful cramps all through her legs. She fell down and slid and hit her head against the wall, only she didn't even notice the pain of the smack as she started to scream with the twisting muscles. The bully was still stalking toward her, Hannah saw as she turned her head, approaching her slowly, still wearing that dreadful smile. And she rolled, despite the pain as her leg muscles knotted up around themselves, she rolled around the corner of the passageway and screamed, Go away! I think not, said the bully, his voice deep and scary like that of a grown man, sounding very close at hand now. The bully walked around the corner, and Daphne Greengrass stabbed her most ancient blade directly into his groin. There was a flash that lit up the whole corridor. End first half of chapter 72 Thank you to the following people. Hermione Granger, Anonymous. Daphne Greengrass, Jesse Cotton. Casey Davis was voiced by Luffy. Lavender Brown by Paige Smith. Hannah Abbott, Mars. Padme and Paravati Patil by Amanda Grisello. Lauren Housley as Susan Bones. Quibbler Headlines by Phil Fulu. This chapter's original text, production notes, and attribution links along with archives and much more, can be found at hpmorpodcast.com. If you would like to learn more about the art of rationality, please visit lesswrong.com, an online community of aspiring rationalists founded by Eliezer Yudkowsky. Some sound effects used are courtesy of the Free Sound Project. The music used is Catch That Goblin by Skaven. Thank you for listening, and come back next week for the second half of Chapter 72, Self-Actualization, Part 7, Plausible Deniability.